Thank you, Shri. It really is a pleasure to be here, to see so many people come out uh, to learn about uh, health and disease and science and all the exciting stuff that is going on uh, on the Stanford campus. So uh, chances are uh, nearly all of you in this room have been touched by cancer in some way. Maybe as a patient yourself, uh, a family member, uh, a dear friend, a teacher, a colleague. You know, cancer really is uh, pervasive uh, in uh, modern society. Uh, and we have made substantial uh, gains in the treatment of cancer. We are seeing uh, declining uh, death rates, but I think we all know uh, that there is much, much more work to be done. Uh, more than 500,000 Americans will die of cancer this year. Um, because health care, uh, heart disease, the rate of disease, rate of death from heart disease is falling, um, around 2020, cancer is poised to be the leading cause of death in the United States and in California. Um, so uh, what are the researchers doing? And uh, how are we going to continue and hopefully accelerate uh, progress against this killer? And what I'm going to talk to you today about is immunotherapy. And this is the sort of newest uh, and um, most exciting uh, area of cancer research today. Uh, and I want to share with you, first of all, how we got here. Uh, because it didn't happen by accident and it didn't happen overnight. Uh, and I want to share with you some reasons why we are enthusiastic about its potential uh, for future progress. I apologize, I can only point on one side, so I won't point too much, except when I absolutely have to. Um, I'm going to start with a uh, really historical context, because it's such a fascinating history. Um, and this uh, book by Stephen Hall, um, who uh, was published in the late 90s, um, so it's not up to date with what's been happening in the last couple years, but it's a great reference for the history of cancer immunotherapy. And what Stephen tells us about in this book is a story uh, about a young lady named Bessie Dashiell. And Bessie lived in uh, New Jersey and had become really good friends with uh, the son of John D. Rockefeller. He was named John D. Rockefeller Jr. Um, and uh, when she was 17, uh, she developed a swelling on her wrist that became very painful. Now, this is 1890. So she was referred from uh, New Jersey uh, to the hospital in New York, then called Memorial Hospital. Uh, we now know it as Memorial Sloan Kettering Hospital. Um, but at Memorial Hospital, uh, she was seen by a very promising young physician by the name of William Cooley. Uh, of course, he was a surgeon, because in those days, that was really the only treatment that we had. Uh, and it turned out that the swelling on her wrist was a cancer, um, what they call a sarcoma, which is a cancer of soft tissues. Uh, and a malignant tumor. So William Cooley performed an amputation, uh, removed her entire arm, um, but uh, the tumor had spread, uh, and she died within the year. Now, the death of Bessie, uh, as it is with you know, all, I mean, you, know, you lose young children and young adults to cancer. I mean, it, it is just truly devastating. Um, and it had a profound effect on the Rockefeller family. And uh, it, you know, we don't know for sure, but it is um, suggested that it, it had uh, really led them to be so philanthropic uh, in terms of medical research, when they were certainly one of the leading uh, uh, groups that gave rise to Memorial Sloan Kettering, for instance, and the Rockefeller Institute. Um, and Bessie's death also had a profound effect on Dr. William Cooley. Uh, and he really thought, can't we do any better? And so he set out to think about how he might approach cancer in a different way. Uh, and he actually received much of his funding for this from the Rockefeller family. So William Cooley is, uh, I think we all recognize him as the father of cancer immunotherapy. Um, he uh, took about searching the records of Memorial Hospital uh, because he had heard rumors that there were some patients who had things like Bessie had, sarcomas, uh, and had had uh, regressions. Um, or, um, you know, much better outcomes. And he identified one patient by the name of Mr. Stein, that's all we know about him, uh, who had a similar sarcoma. But at the time of the surgery, he had a severe infection. Now remember, there weren't any antibiotics in those days to speak of. 
And so when you got an infection, I mean, it was severe, and you either survived it or you died of it, but you had a wide, you know, very uh, robust um, activation of your immune system. And Mr. Stein's tumor never uh, returned. And so this intrigued Dr. Cooley, and he asked this fundamental question. Maybe the infection was part of the reason why this tumor didn't return. And so he wanted to test the hypothesis, and he conducted a series of experiments, which, of course, would never be allowed today. <laughs> I mean, the amazing thing is Bessie died in 1890, and by 1891, he was injecting uh, bacteria into patients to see whether he could induce infections and make their tumors go away. And those were called Cooley's toxins. Now, um, did they work? Uh, it sort of depends what you read. Um, and, you know, whether a few um, what we call um, um, outlier patients uh, inspire you or not. There were clearly some patients in whom it worked. Um, most uh, notable was this patient called Mr. Zula, who was near death due to a, a sarcoma that had lodged in his throat. Uh, Ms. Dr. Cooley gave him a few bacterial injections. They weren't very strong. Not much happened. He then found a more stronger bacteria. Uh, and it worked, and Zola's cancer went away. So, of course, uh, William Cooley was convinced, um, and he set about now to try to bring the, this approach into the mainstream of cancer treatment. And uh, frankly, uh, he had a really difficult time. Um, the medical establishment, uh, in general, didn't think that what he was doing was appropriate. Uh, and in this book, it tells his story because the medical establishment was uh, epitomized by this man, James Ewing. James Ewing was the physician-in-chief at Memorial Hospital. He was a pathologist who, uh, whose namesake is a tumor that I've studied at length called Ewing sarcoma. And uh, James Ewing had begun to study the role of radiation in the treatment of cancer. And so James Ewing had a radiation machine that he could turn on, give a certain dose, see the tumor shrink, uh, give another dose, he could measure his therapy, and he reproducibly could see benefit. What happened with William Cooley was he occasionally had spectacular cases, but most of the time it didn't work. And when people would say, Dr. Cooley, why didn't it work? He would not really not be able to explain it. So it's pretty clear who won, um, James Ewing did. Um, and so during the next, really, century, um, we all know how cancer was treated for the most part, surgery, radiation therapy, uh, and ultimately chemotherapy after World War II became uh, an important part of the uh, armamentarium. Um, and certainly, you know, these are very active uh, approaches, uh, and there was clearly a substantial improvement in cure rates for some cancers. But we all know that there were many cancers for which these approaches had limited benefit, if any, and, you know, the problem was they were also toxic. Um, and so, it, you know, it, it was hard to believe that this was as good as we could do. Um, now, at the same time, during this period in which cancer therapy was uh, evolving, there was really a very vested uh, uh, approach and attack in terms of learning more about the immune system. And when you look at funding for biomedical research uh, from the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s on, much of that funding uh, went to understand how the human immune system works. And it's really complicated. We learned that there are different arms of the immune system that can be divided into T cells and B cells, antibodies, natural killer cells, innate cells. And these cells called T cells, uh, which are named for where they come from, the thymus, um, were found to be able to kill cancer. Um, but the problem was they had difficulty recognizing the difference between a cancer cell and a tumor cell. But the T cell uh, killing machinery is very potent. Um, they are naturally um, induced when we have a viral infection. So when you have a cold, it's the T cells uh, that get rid of that virus. And in HIV infection, it was the T cells uh, that were um, you know, killed by the virus and left those patients so profoundly immunocompromised. So uh, these immunologists knew that there was potential with T cells for cancer, um, but they couldn't figure out how to harness them and how to amplify their power. 
Um, so when you think about the immune system, you know, uh, one thing uh, to, to realize about it is it pervades every other system of your body. It doesn't matter if we're talking about the nervous system or the cardiovascular system or, the, or your bowels or your lungs. The immune system is there. And it is surveying every organ of your body. And um, really, its job is to look for danger. It looks for signals that say, ah, something's wrong here. I need to get activated. And, and these, uh, the immune system anatomically can be described as a series of lymphatic vessels that transport uh, immune cells, as well as the bone marrow and the spleen and the thymus, which help to produce these cells. But the essence of the immune system really is this army of white blood cells. Um, they sense danger, and they attack the source. Now, the white blood cells, you know, they come in many, many different shapes and sizes. And, you know, people spend their entire life studying one of these cells because, again, it's complicated. But again, here on this list of immune cells, you see this guy over here, the T cell, which, again, had much power uh, and really much sophistication because the T cell had the ability to have memory, it's the T cells that when you're exposed as a baby to a, a virus, let's say chickenpox, or uh, um, some other virus that you don't, you're immune to it for the rest of your life. And this picture is complicated. There was, I, I just wanted to show you that um, not only are there many different cells, but these cells are arranged in networks. And in every different organ of the body, the network is a bit different. So this is talking about the gut. And how does the immune system relate to the bacteria in the gut? Because it can't get activated and believe that's a danger all the time. We know there's bacteria there. So again, there's a lot of complexity to these networks and these circuits. And there are activating cells and suppressor cells. And so it really did take most of the 20th century for us to even get a handle on the complexity of this system. But in the meantime, in the second half of the 20th century, we started to see some signals that what William Cooley was trying to do uh, was beginning to slowly reap benefit. Arguably, the, most, uh, the first effective immunotherapy for cancer is bone marrow transplantation. Uh, you all have, I'm sure, many of you have heard of it. Um, it's a treatment that is very intensive. Uh, the patient receives very high doses of chemotherapy or radiation. Um, and they are then administered stem cells, either from themselves, but often from a sibling or an unrelated donor. And it turned out that bone marrow transplantation was pretty good at curing leukemia. And at first, we thought it was all the chemotherapy. But then we realized that, in fact, one of the reasons bone marrow transplantation worked was because of the T cells that were included in the bone marrow graft that killed off the leukemia. So again, the signal is there that the T cells are something we need to harness. There's a molecule called interleukin-2. It was uh, developed at the NIH. It was one of the reasons I went to the NIH in the 90s, in the late 80s, uh, because administering this agent that activates T cells induced uh, regressions in a small fraction of patients with melanoma, only 15%. Uh, but it clearly had activity, again, teaching us that there's a signal there. There's something that we could harness. Monoclonal antibodies are another immunotherapy that have clearly had a major impact. Stanford was at the cutting edge of the development of rituximab, the first monoclonal antibody uh, for the treatment of cancer. And um, so this is a very powerful arm of the immune system. The challenge of monoclonal antibodies is, though, they don't work if you have an existing tumor. They really need to be given with chemotherapy or for low-level disease. Um, one of the uh, groups at NIH started to, in uh, the 1990s and 2000s, actually take cells out of a patient with cancer, expand them in the test tube, in the bags, in the, in the lab, and then reinfuse them, uh, arguing that there must be T cells there and we just need more of them. That's called adoptive immunotherapy. And that showed some activity in melanoma. Uh, and then we had the first tumor vaccine in 2010. So, you know, there was activity. But I'll be very honest with you, when uh, people like I started in this field, uh, when we would go to the meetings, our session would always be on the last day, <laughs> the last half, you know. Uh, it was generally not as well attended. Uh, it was kind of an afterthought. And the mainstream oncology community really thought 
that it was simply too complicated and that we were probably, it was stated that, you know, cancer immunotherapists are more about religion than science. We had a belief, um, but the data maybe didn't uh, add up in terms of how fervent the belief was. And then everything changed. And there was a, a real tipping point or a turning point. And it happened in 2010. Um, and, you know, by all accounts, this is when the planets aligned. And again, it's not because anything necessarily magical happened in 2010. It's just that finally the fruits of our labors, the investment in major in basic biomedical research started to pay off. So what happened? Clinical trials. We started to see activity in clinical trials. So here are the preeminent journals putting cancer immunotherapy on their uh, front page. I mean, when 2013, when the journal Science said that cancer immunotherapy was the breakthrough of the year in all of all of uh, you know research in general, uh, we knew uh, that this was the beginning of a new day. Uh, cover of Time magazine. Um, so what were we talking about? Well, mostly what we were talking about is this therapy called checkpoint blockade. And you all have heard about checkpoint blockade if you watch any TV at all because you see all these advertisements every evening for uh, immunotherapy for cancer and it's likely to be uh, one of these checkpoint blockers. So what is checkpoint blockade? Well, what we've come to understand now is that in some cancer patients, there are T cells already present that know the cancer is there and have this, the, the capability to go after that cancer. This is a surprise. We didn't know that to be true uh, before uh, we learned how to turn those cells on. Well, why, if the T cells are there, aren't they killing the cancer? Well, as it turns out, the tumor expresses a molecule that turns the T cells off. It puts the brakes on the immune response. These tumors are very smart, and those are called checkpoint receptors. Checkpoint blockade antibodies are simply antibodies that go in there and interrupt that interaction. So in fact, we didn't need to induce new responses at all. For many cancers, all we needed to do was to take the brakes off. And this uh, discovery is credited to a man named Jim Allison, uh, who started his career at Berkeley, um, then went to New uh, Memorial, is now at uh, MD Anderson. Uh, Jim discovered that this checkpoint, anti-CTLA-4, could induce responses in melanoma. And that was great, but it was pretty toxic, and it only worked in melanoma. And then came the real breakthrough, uh, this other checkpoint called PD-1, um, which is uh, even more powerful and is generally well, well tolerated when you block it. So when you look at the scope of cancer, and I, I didn't put too many data slides in here today, but this is one that I think is really important. What this is is looking at many different types of cancers. And of course, cancer is not one disease. Each of these cancers has its own biology. And when you look at the many different types of cancer, what you see is that checkpoint blockade works in these cancers melanoma, lung cancer, bladder cancer, stomach cancer. Why? Why in those cancers and not in these cancers over here? Pediatric tumors, unfortunately, it doesn't work. Well, as it turns out, these cancers have more genetic mutations. So if you arrange cancer up in terms of how many mistakes in the genome the cancer has made, these are the ones that have most. If you're a smoker, your lung cancer has lots of genetic mutations, and you have a pretty good response, chance of responding to this checkpoint blockade. So now cancer biologists are starting to divide cancers into groups based on whether they have immunogenicity, something the immune system can see, or non-immunogenicity where they don't respond to checkpoints. And this is, you know, of course, the, 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 the he triple helix that is the DNA um, that leads to the production of proteins in the cancer cell. And every time that cancer cell divides, the DNA has to split and come back together. And it has to come back together with matched pairs. And that's how you make proteins that are healthy and normal. But when the cancer is doing all this division, it makes mistakes. And those mistakes lead to a mismatch. See this guy? The red is supposed to be with red. The blue is supposed to be with blue. Here you have a red and a blue matched up. When this protein is formed, then what you get is a mutant protein. It may be only mutant in one amino acid, but it can be detected as foreign by the immune system. The immune system is incredibly precise. 
And so the number of these mutant proteins that are in the tumor, that's what we're measuring here. How many new mutant proteins are there? Now, we've always thought that more mutant proteins are bad because that's the genetic instability that gives the tumor so much power that it can, it can tolerate all this. But here, now we're turning it into an Achilles heel. Those mutant proteins are actually something that the immune system can see. So here we are, we're in 2018. I said in 2010, we saw our first responses with these, this thing is on fire. Um, we call it immuno-oncology. That's what pharma calls it. Um, and basically, it is the dominant focus of cancer research, whether it be an academic institution, a small biotech, or big pharma. There are now 26 immunotherapies approved by the Food and Drug Administration in 17 different cancers that have an FDA-approved immunotherapy as part of its treatment option. And then this is the, the just the mind-boggling piece. There are 940 agents in clinical development modulating 271 targets. Because it's why we understand so much about the immune system now. Now what we're trying to do is take this fundamental observation and build on it. Right? We know PD-1 and CTLA-4 are important, but what if we combine that with other agents? This is just looking at scientific literature. These are cancer immunotherapy publications. Look at this. Everybody is working on it. It's not just the cancer immunotherapists anymore. It's the cancer biologists. It's the bioengineers. Uh, everybody is coming into the space. So the hope is that those patients that have immunogenic cancers, that we can start to move the bar towards patients with less mutations and some of the patients with the diseases like melanoma that are lower, that we can increase the rate of response. And how can you do that? Well, you just start adding things to the checkpoint inhibitors. And this is where you get all those 900 drugs that are in clinical trials right now. Now, so that's good news. The problem is if you're on the far left side of that curve, and pediatric cancers are the prime example of that, there are some cancers where there just aren't that many genetic mutations. Maybe they just have one really bad gene that drives the whole program. And we don't believe that those cancers are going to respond to simply taking the brakes off. We have to trick the immune system into doing something it wouldn't otherwise do. And so this is another class of immune responses, I call uh, immune uh, agents, I call them synthetic immunotherapies. We're basically trying to initiate a response that didn't already happen. And a prototype for that is something called a chimeric antigen receptor. So now this is what a normal healthy T cell looks like. Um, it has to recognize something that instructs it to become activated, and when it gets activated, it then will you know, kill whatever the target is, in this case, the cancer. Um, and that um, receptor that gets activated uh, has to recognize these peptides. And I talked about the mutant proteins that it can recognize. Um, but because the tumors that are low for mutant peptides don't have anything for the T cell receptor to recognize, how can we trick the T cell into getting activated? Well, a very clever scientist back in 1989 had an idea that what if I use part of an antibody, that the antibody I can create to recognize anything I want on the surface of a cell, and I, lat I link up the antibody with the signaling part of the T cell. And then that T cell now has been directed to respond to a tumor recognizing whatever that target is. And as Shri mentioned, this target uh, can be almost anything that we uh, would like, but CD19 on the surface of B cell malignancies has turned out to be a really fruitful target. So let's take childhood leukemia. Here are the T cells in a, in a child with uh, leukemia, and here are the, uh, immune, the tumor cells, the leukemic cells. And as I mentioned, the T cells, you know, there are generally some T cells there, but they just can't recognize the leukemia, and so they just basically ignore it. CAR therapy is basically taking the T cells, and we take them out of the arm of the child or the adult, and we take them into the lab, and we uh, engineer them. And what engineering is really about is, is DNA engineering, it's gene therapy. So we basically put a gene into those cells that encode that receptor, that then directs the cell to go after any, any cell that expresses CD19. And so when these cells then are reinfused back into the patient, they see the leukemia and they go after it. They expand and they can kill the tumor. And this can all happen really very quickly. Um, 
I put this in here. I hope it works. Uh, this is a, a little film from my, my laboratory that uh, this is another CAR T cell. And uh, here, here are the tumor. The tumor is in red here. And I'm going to turn this on. And hopefully these T cells, these little guys, are going to come in and go after that tumor uh, and eat it. Now, this happens over about four hours or so. Kind of crazy. I mean, these things are really potent. They're little guys. They're like little, you know, and they go after these big tumors. Um, so this is an example of a patient we treated. Um, this is a teenager whose leukemia had, you know, he hadn't, all of the standard therapies were no longer working for him. And here's the leukemia in his bloodstream, that red cell there. These are his normal B cells. And you infuse the CAR T cells, and you can measure them using this, this flow cytometry technique that was developed at Stanford. Um, and uh, you don't have any before you put them in, but in 10 days, they have expanded to take over 80% of his entire T cell pool in his body are those CAR T cells. And they go after anything that has 19 on it, whether it be a normal B cell or a malignant B cell. So that's why it's dangerous. We have to be careful what we target because we don't want it to attack healthy normal tissues. But this has worked really remarkably well for childhood leukemia. And this young lady here, uh, Emily Whitehead, has been truly the poster child for this therapy. Uh, Emily was the first child to receive CAR T cells. She was treated at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia uh, when she was six years old in the spring of 2012. They gave her an infusion of these things. Uh, you know, she got very ill. Um, you know, oftentimes, especially because she had a lot of leukemia, these cells expanded very rapidly. Uh, temperatures of 105, 106. She had to go to the ICU. She had to receive fluids and treatment. It was as if she had the worst flu you can imagine. And it lasted for a few days. And in fact, they thought they were going to lose Emily. Uh, and her doctors ended up using a, uh, an antibody uh, to turn off one of the cytokines that were being elaborated by the T cell, and she turned around. And uh, within about a week, she was feeling well. Um, by 28 days after the infusion, she was in remission, uh, couldn't find any tumor, and this is 2012. She's a little school-age girl. Here she's a preteen at the uh, FDA advisory committee meeting when they approved this therapy five years later. And those cells are still circulating in Emily's body, looking for any tumor that might come back. So this is one infusion, one little bag of cells, made her very sick. We learned now how to control that thing called cytokine release syndrome. One of the things that our dream team that Sri alluded to has been working on very carefully. We brought together all the pediatric groups in North America working on this and devised ways to uh, uh, measure the toxicity and respond to it in a systematic way. And I think we really can deliver these uh, much, much more safely now. So that's the good news. It's really powerful. It's a watershed moment. Um, but of course, it's cancer. And the thing is tricky. And all of those kids that go into remission don't stay in remission. Um, maybe up to half will relapse. Um, and so now we're learning how does the cancer win. Um, and one of, the way it win one of the ways in which it wins is about the target. So again, this CD19, here's this flow cytometry again. If you look, if it's over here, it means it has the 19. It has something else called 22. They all look like they're 19 and 22 positive. But after you give CD19 CAR, some patients will come back, and their leukemia will look otherwise identical, except they lost that one little protein. So t tumors are very resilient. Uh, they can do all kinds of things when you put pressure on them. And so what we've done now is to start to make double CARs, uh, either infusing two populations or co-expression. This is the way we've done it here at Stanford. We were able to, for the first time, test a double CAR in the clinic. So instead of just targeting one molecule, we're able to target two molecules at the same time. So hopefully, if the tumor gets rid of 19, we've got 22 on there. We think statistically it's less likely that they'll lose both molecules at the same time. Uh, this is one of our lymphoma patients treated here with our double CAR, uh, who you can see had a lot of tumor in his belly and had a very nice response. This is the heart and the, and the kidneys and the bladder. So really, nearly all of the tumor went away. We were left with this one dot there. Um, so I think that uh, 
what needs to happen going forward, there's a lot more basic science that needs to happen, but we also need more of what we call this translational science. And this is what's near and dear to my heart. Um, it's basically this loop that brings together the idea and really uh, takes the idea that the uh, scientist makes in the laboratory and turns it into a treatment. And so that's a lot of effort. You have to take the idea and, and make it into a therapy, something that's reproducible enough, you can give it to people. Um, you have to manufacture it in a highly sterile, highly controlled environment. You need to work very closely with the FDA because you're doing now very, uh, uh, you're, you're testing agents that you don't really know how they're gonna behave. Um, the patients and the families, they want you to take risks, but it has to be calculated risks. Um, and then, uh, perhaps most importantly, once you start that trial, your work begins because then you study those patients. You learn from every patient that you treat. If it worked, you try to figure out why did it work in this patient and why didn't it work in the other patient, and then you go back to the bench and say, I'm going to make my next generation because you rarely get a home run the first time. And it's been great in B-cell ALL, but what we really need to do is to use these things in solid tumors and brain tumors. And they're, you know, they've, they're more complicated. Um, and so we're hoping that we can use this, what we call iterative cycle of translational research, uh, to make progress. So my takeaways for you guys are cancer researchers have worked for more than a century to use the immune system to treat cancer. The major breakthroughs finally began around 2010 and now immunotherapy is at the cutting edge of cancer research. Um, the immune system and cancer, though, are very, very, both very complex. And therefore, the development of successful immunotherapies, it really required extensive research in the basic science. And this is something that is important, I think, for the public to understand, that you know, sometimes you wonder, well, why do we spend all this money on science in you know, flies or worms or, you know, but it is where some of the fundamental discoveries happen. And you can't believe how they come in handy when you're trying to create these therapies. So we really, we need fundamental research, and we need translational research, and we need, we need it all if you're going to keep the progress going. There are two main classes of cancer immunotherapies. There are uh, the checkpoint inhibitor type, which basically amplify an existent immune response. And then there are the CAR T cell type, which create a new response that wasn't uh, there. And I think we're definitely going to see continued progress, but uh, basically we know there's an iceberg. We don't know how big the iceberg is. Um, but with continued uh, research, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm very confident we'll continue to see progress. So uh, I'll stop there. I think we've got uh, some good time for questions. Um, So I was instructed, there's a Facebook Live, and the first question was supposed to be Facebook Live, and then we'll, we'll get folks, okay? What are the potential advantages of immunotherapy over precision-targeted chemotherapy with experimental drugs for, let's say, ERK and a MAP kinase pathway tumor or BRAF um, and tumors with RAS mutations? So, um, you know, immuno, immunotherapies today are being used uh, for the most part in, in relapsed and refractory patients. One of the big breakthroughs at the cancer meeting in April was that um, immunotherapy is now approved frontline for some patients with lung cancer. But it's important to note that if your patient with lung cancer has one of these mutations, in fact, the recommendation is that you don't receive immunotherapy first. You receive the small molecule first that goes after the signaling pathway. So I in no way want to give you the impression that immunotherapy is the only, uh, you know, there are a lot of other good therapies for cancer out there, and cancer is complex, and that's why you need oncologists. Because each, each little cancer histology is now then divided into different types of cancers, and um, it's only by carefully, you know, knowing the clinical trials that you know what the right therapy is for the right patient. So for some patients, the right treatment are those uh, small molecules. For other patients, the right treatment is immunotherapy. Of course, we all want to use them together, and so they're working on that. I thank you for a very insightful talk. Uh, my question is, for the tumors that have fewer mutations, isn't it easier to treat them because there are fewer mutations in them, and you can probably just even precisely understand the mutations and then target them with specific molecules? 
Yes, and, and I think I'm supposed to repeat. Do I need to, even though she, I think because of the Facebook Live, I don't need to, thank you. Um, yeah, it would seem that right, way, right? I mean, we had always thought about the genetic instability as the problem and that those tumors would be more aggressive because they have more pathways, let's say, to, uh, to live, live on. Um, one of the problems is that all, all abnormal proteins aren't druggable. So I'm going to talk about pediatric tumors in particular. Um, the, the tumor on the farthest left-hand side of the curve is something called rhabdoid tumor. It's a devastating tumor that afflicts babies. Um, and those tumors often have one mutation, uh, and it's in a histone gene. And that mutation in the histone gene leads to widespread overexpression of many um, proteins that are normal. Now, how do you attack that histone gene? We don't have a drug to do that. Our drugs largely attack mutant kinases. So we really haven't been able to develop a way to drug transcription factors and the epigenome. If we do that, then diseases like rhabdoid uh, hopefully would be controllable. But right now, we don't have drugs for that. Hi, Doctor. Um, I'm over here. <laughs> uh, thank you so much. Your presentation was so informative. I really enjoyed it. Um, two questions, uh, real quick. Um, is Stanford now at the cutting edge of this um, research? Are they moving faster than other resources? And also, um, since the pediatric cancer has such a successful rate now on the left spectrum, is breast cancer and other cancers that were in the middle are they, are those case studies moving faster too? Yeah. Well, you know, as far as Stanford, and I mean, I'm biased, right? <laughs> the Stanford Center for Cancer Cell Therapy is the epicenter of progress here, right? Um, we're on the map in terms of CAR T cells uh, at this time. We're not the only place, but there really are only a handful of places uh, in the country that are really doing this work because Doing CAR T-cell therapy is very expensive. It requires a huge commitment from the institution because you have to manufacture these things yourself. You're not just ordering them from a pharmacy. So I think that Stanford is at the cutting edge, but I wouldn't say it's the only site, to be honest. Um, uh, the diseases. Um, there's so many diseases that need effort. Breast cancer, as you see it, sitting right in there. It hasn't, you know, there's been a little bit of data in triple negative breast cancer, um, but that is a disease where people are really going after the multi-modality, uh, the checkpoint plus. Checkpoint plus this, checkpoint plus that, because it has some mutations, but it's intermediate, it's not high. Um, we would love to develop a car for breast cancer, and I think there are some groups that are doing it. We don't have one developed yet. So uh, we all have breast cancer in our sites, but I'm, you know, I wish I could tell you it's going to be, you know, just around the corner, and I, I don't know that it is. Uh, has the research in immunotherapy taught us anything about how cancer metastasizes and appears as yet another kind of cancer? Yes. Um, well, so the problem of metastasis, right? Um, you know, for those of you who don't think about this all the time, um, you know, patients don't rarely die of their primary cancer. Uh, the treatments we have can generally control that, surgery, radiation. Um, what kills patients is when the tumor then leaves that primary site uh, and sets up shop in a different organ, and for whatever reason, uh, once they metastasize, they acquire, you know, more power, let's say. Um, and one of the problems is most of the studies on cancer have focused on you biopsy the tumor at the time it's diagnosed, and that's the primary. And so now we're coming to understand that we need to do a lot more study on the metastasis. We need to understand paired, paired primary metastatic tumors. Um, you know, I don't know that uh, we know that metastatic sites are uh, primed by the immune system to allow them to grow. If you uh, knock out some of these facilitating cells, they're not the T cells, they're the myeloid cells, the metastasis are less likely to grow. So there are those who believe if you interrupt that, you will prevent metastasis, but it doesn't treat established metastasis. Um, I think one of the big problems is heterogeneity. What we're learning is that cancer, you know, let's say you have a patient who develops metastasis, and maybe they develop you know, five or six nodules in the lung, 
you might biopsy this one and it looks like something, and then you might biopsy this one and you get uh, something else. And so um, that is a problem that certainly afflicts the treatment with the small molecules. We don't yet know how important that's going to be for immunotherapy. Um, that's why people like checkpoint blockade because the feeling is it doesn't really matter what the antigen is. It, uh, the body decides for you because if you take the breaks off, hopefully there are T cells targeting multiple antigens and if this tumor is different than this one. So I think it's one of the reasons immunotherapy has been as effective because those have been all, essentially all in metastatic patients. But again, uh, more work needs to be done for sure. Uh, doctor, thank you for giving us an overview of the great work that you're doing. Uh, my question is about the artificial T cells and whether they can be used to help patients that are uh, com have compromised immune systems just generally. Hmm. Well, uh, you know, when we administer those cells, they they unless they're going after a target, they don't do much. You know, they just get in there and kind of sit and then die off unless there's a target that you go after. Um, and frankly, probably what we're doing to those patients' immune systems is not making them more healthy in general. We're basically saying, I'm going to hijack your immune system to all go after one thing for a while, this cancer. And what makes for a healthy immune system is a more broad-based immune system that can, you know, attack anything that comes its way. So I don't know how the CAR T cells would be used to do that. I, maybe somebody could come up with a way, but I think right now we're really thinking about them to attack a particular target. Now people are thinking about them for autoimmunity to try to, um, you know, maybe put the, the, the receptor into a suppressive cell. And we think that if that was the case, let's say if you had rheumatoid arthritis or lupus, and we could turn on the suppressor cells in a specific way, we might be able to turn off the autoimmune reaction. So there will be different applications of these things um, over time, but, yeah. For, forgive my ignorance, but my grandmother had cancer on her job on, and then my mother uh, had to remove her ovary. Uh, so grandmother was in 80s and mother was 2010. Um, is there any way uh, that runs in hereditary like uh, cancer? And second question is, uh, in case of MLA, uh, her T cell was altered. Will that alteration pass down to next generation? Yes. So with regard to the question of is, does gene therapy of these T cells lead to changes in the next generation? It does not. These cells are uh, not the germline. Her eggs and, you know, the, her germ cells that would give rise to a baby were not impacted by the gene therapy. So that would not be passed on. Um, as far as the heredity and how much of cancer is inherited, um, you know, I think that that book is still being written. Um, you know, it's a common disease. It afflicts, you know, you know, many, many. So I don't think that, you know, we all have some predisposition. The biggest predisposition seems to be aging. Um, and maybe if we all live long enough, maybe we'd all get cancer. You know, it's, it's possible that we all have some predisposition. Um, but I think that especially if you develop cancer at a younger age, certainly in children, we now come to believe that about 10% of children's cancers are probably related significantly to a genetic inheritance, you know, and they might or might not pass this on to their children. Um, and I think that, you know, young ladies that develop breast cancer, of course you go looking for BRCA1 and some of those inherited syndromes. Uh, I think in the elderly, it's probably less likely that you're going to find something, and so it's not part of the standard treatment. Thank you very much for a very inspiring talk uh, about um, using the immune system or manipulation of the immune system to, to attack cancer. My question was, um, what, if, what if the immune system is part of the problem? Can you use uh, some of these same techniques to address the immune system as part of a problem? I think you may have given a partial answer just in mm -hmm. a previous question talking about the autoimmune, but I was hoping you could expand on that. 
Yeah, boy, that's a complicated question. Um, you know, the B cell malignancies that we're treating are immune cancers. And I think that that's where CARs have had their most biggest impact, is in lymphoma and leukemia. And we know that many patients that develop those have some kind of abnormality in their immune system that probably caused them to develop a lymphoma, for instance. So in some ways, uh, you know, we may be attack the root of the problem by going after the malignant cells. Um, but again, I don't see CAR T cells at this time as being a, uh, a, a, a something I would think as a near-term approach for treating immune dysfunction. Yeah. We'll do a couple more questions. Yeah. Let me do a Facebook uh, yeah. okay. uh, live. There are a couple more on there. Um, what are the other ways patients can tell if immunotherapy is working if current CT imaging is unable to distinguish between tumor growth and inflammation? This is a very interesting question because this has confused the clinicians treating these patients occasionally. Um, what we'll see is that when you give chemotherapy, you know, you really look at those x-rays and they tell you everything. Either that tumor shrinks and the chemotherapy is working, or if the tumor grows, it's not. You're done with the chemotherapy. But with immunotherapy, what we've seen is that sometimes the tumor will get bigger, and then it will shrink. And so people have been misled and thought, oh, the patient isn't benefiting. But what we've come to call that is something called pseudoprogression. And it means that actually the T cells are going in there and causing a bunch of inflammation, and the tumor is becoming swollen. And so we now allow patients on immunotherapy trials to stay on the treatment even if there's a bit of growth on the tumor as long as they're otherwise feeling well. I just saw some exciting data from uh, a group here at Stanford that is doing liquid biopsies, developed liquid biopsies to be able to monitor um, the pace of, of tumor growth. And, and they have got some very nice examples of patients treated with immunotherapy who have persistent um, what looks like a persistent tumor. And we've all heard about these patients. They go on the immunotherapy, and the tumor shrinks, but it doesn't go away, and it just sits there. And um, when the group at Stanford here looks in the bloodstream, these patients don't have any circulating tumor DNA. The liquid biopsy is negative. And then you go in and look, and these are scars. So um, imaging is certainly you know, pretty crude currently. Um, I'm really enamored by the ability to monitor stuff in the bloodstream. I think it's, uh, it's got a lot of potential. So there are other ways. They're not standard yet, but. Hi, doctor. First of all, I'd like to thank you a lot for this talk. I'm currently taking um, immunotherapy. I'm on nivolumab, and I did ipilimumab for three out of the four trials. Wow. Um, and currently, thankfully, I'm almost in remission. And Wonderful. Congratulations. Thank you so much. Um, um, my question is, after remission, I mean, I do this exercise with my doctor where we think like a cancer, which is we imagine the worst possible case, which is how it would decide to come back. And my overall question is, does immunotherapy stimulate the immune system for long periods of time, or should I continue on it since it is working, if that makes sense? Yeah, and, and you know, I can't give you a recommendation from the podium, because I don't, I don't know your case. Um, and it, wouldn't, it would be irresponsible of me. But, um, but in, one of the things that's been remarkable about immunotherapy, especially the CTLA-4, is it's kind of a toxic drug. I mean, some patients get sick with it. And when they get sick, their doctor has to stop it because, I mean, they can get terrible diarrhea and have to have their bowel resected. And we now know, you know, you, you, it's, it's significant, yeah. Um, but it seems like when you stop it, it doesn't matter. Once that autoimmune reaction has happened, those patients who either get, you know, months and months of it or relatively short term and had to stop because of toxicity, they both have done equally well. Now, it may be because the ones that get autoimmunity had the really good, you know, the really strong impact. I think with nivolumab, it's less clear, and so people have continued it. But yeah, I, I, it, it isn't like chemo, where if you're not taking it, it's not helping you. 
the immunotherapy, there may be some benefit after you stop taking it because the immune response is going. Um, but it's, a, it's always a really tough question. I don't, yeah. Hi, doctor. Thanks for your talk. It's very informative. And my question is something similar, but like a little bit more on the other side where immunotherapy does not help a patient, especially elderly with advanced carcinoma. Um, and it actually it creates uh, um, autoimmune pneumonitis or hepatitis. Um, uh, and, and we have to stop the immunotherapy after certain doses because it clearly did not help. Um, what can, is there anything that can be done to reverse the, the side effects or, or ill effects of immunotherapy or toxins um, so that the patient can have better quality of life for the remaining uh, of their days? Yeah, um, you know, there are a lot of immunosuppressive agents out there, like the one Emily Whitehead received. I mean, that's what we use for CAR T cells. There are other classes that are used for uh, the problems that come after PD-1 blockade. So corticosteroids are the front line. Usually these improve with corticosteroids, and then there are second and third line immunosuppressive agents. So I would hope that with the appropriate immunosuppressive therapy, that the side effect would go away, I think. Uh, so, so to continue that, so uh, with those uh, immunosuppressant agents, uh, then would the patient become more uh, prone to infectious diseases? And that's where, you know, it's kind of like a battle both ways. Yeah, of course. It's always a tightrope. Okay. Um, when you have a severe, I mean, one of the challenges is now that these are being treated, these are being given in, you know, oncologists' office around the country, and oncologists are used to treating low blood counts, nausea, you know, the, the side effects of chemo, but they are not used to treating the side effects of immunotherapies. And I think there's a lot more that needs to be learned about how those side effects should be managed, how long do you need to keep them on, because that immunosuppressive treatment has a downside for sure. Yeah. Yes, doctor, um, regarding uh, non-small cell lung cancer, with chemotherapy, immunotherapy, uh, which one of those you think will have the greatest uh, success uh, in uh, uh, controlling non-small cell lung cancer? Yeah, so again, this, uh, this recent meeting of the American Association of Cancer Research uh, was just a real tour de force for looking at the treatment of non-small cell lung cancer with immunotherapy. And uh, I'm not a lung cancer specialist, but my impression was that in the randomized trial, immunotherapy um, beat chemotherapy, um, which was, you know, pretty remarkable, although, frankly, chemotherapy doesn't work that well in lung cancer, so maybe it wasn't that remarkable, but it certainly, you know, I think that many oncologists give chemotherapy in lung cancer kind of reluctantly because it's what you had, but it wasn't as if it was a home run. So I would encourage you, if you want the latest up to date, to really you know, talk to an oncologist because these guidelines are changing by the week based on some of these clinical trials that have just come out. Are we, we have the young man over there, he's very energetic, he wants it. <laughs> you go. Thank you. Um, so I recently just took immunology, and this was a great talk, and I was wondering if you could explain the mechanism behind why Cooley's toxins work and what type of immune yeah. response they stimulate. Thank you. Yeah, so not that we know for sure, but we would postulate that um, among the list, remember on the immunogenic, we have checkpoint first and then checkpoint plus, plus, plus. A lot of the pluses are aimed at activating the innate immune cells in the tumor microenvironment. So bacteria does that very well. In fact, some of the vaccines that are being given still use pieces and parts of bacteria as what we call immune adjuvants. So they get the immune, so they are danger. They're the prototype of danger. So they get the innate immune cells activated, and then those, in turn, help activate the T cell. That's, that's what we would believe, that in this case, the T cells were present, and by turning on the innate immune cells, they just got the T cells over the hump to get activated. That's what we would believe. Last question. Okay. <laughs> Done. Right? Okay. Thank you very much for your attention.